Before warplanes became the currency of national survival, Douglas was riding a golden streak. The DC-3 had conquered the skies, and the DC-4 was gearing up to stretch its wings across oceans. So when engineers sketched out a compact, high-wing feeder airliner with nose-wheel landing gear and remarkable field performance, few doubted it would be another chart-topper. This was the Douglas DC-5, a design so forward-looking you'd be forgiven for assuming it debuted 20 years later. Its shoulder-mounted wings gave passengers an uninterrupted view of the world sliding by. The tricycle gear kept the cabin low enough that ground crews didn't need stairs or ladders. It was clean, quiet, fast off the runway. And just when the aircraft was ready to step into service, the planet went to war. Suddenly, no one needed a short-haul airliner. They needed bombers, dive bombers, fighters. And just like that, the DC-5, technically sound, cleverly crafted, vanished into the footnotes. Only 12 were ever built, and half of those went to the military. In the early 1930s, the Douglas Aircraft Company wasn't just building planes, they were assembling the future. The DC-1, born from a challenge by Transcontinental and Western Air, TWA, laid the groundwork with a streamlined all-metal design that flew just once but made a mark. Its successor, the DC-2, expanded capacity and impressed with speed and efficiency, prompting international orders and solidifying Douglas's reputation. Then came the DC-3, and everything changed. Capable of flying coast to coast, profitable with passengers alone, and rugged enough to serve in dozens of combat theaters, the DC-3 became the benchmark by which every other airliner would be judged. More than 10,000 were built. It redefined travel, and it gave Douglas breathing room to experiment. That's when the DC-4E appeared, a pressurized behemoth with four engines, a triple tail, and advanced systems. But it was too heavy, too complex, and ultimately shelved. The solution? Strip it down. The resulting DC-4, a single-tail, unpressurized workhorse, became another wartime hero and post-war staple. While those big birds stretched routes across continents, Douglas spotted a different opportunity. Local carriers needed something small, quick, and airport-friendly, so they envisioned a compact twin-engine airliner that could land on shorter strips, taxi easily, and load without stairs. The result was the DC-5, a bold shift from everything that came before. A high-wing layout, tricycle landing gear, shoulder-mounted engines that reduced cabin noise. The design was elegant and purposeful, but the aircraft stepped into a market that barely existed and would soon be overshadowed by global war. The DC-5 wasn't ahead of its time. It was beyond it. In the late 1930s, Almost every passenger aircraft still landed on tailwheels. That meant steep, nose-up cabins, awkward stair loading, and limited pilot visibility on the ground. The DC-5 flipped that script. Its tricycle landing gear kept the fuselage level and low, allowing passengers and cargo to be loaded with ease. No steps, no strain. And for pilots, taxiing was simpler and safer. Above that streamlined fuselage sat shoulder-mounted wings, a configuration that let passengers enjoy panoramic views without engines blocking their sightline. Those engines, mounted far from the cabin, also kept noise and vibration to a minimum. Inside, the layout was modular, three compartments that could seat as few as 14 or as many as 22. Large oval windows, gentle ride characteristics, and an uncluttered interior made the aircraft genuinely modern. But the market didn't match the engineering. The DC-5 was envisioned for regional carriers and short-haul operators, a group that barely existed before the war. The U.S. Civil Aviation Aeronautics Board wouldn't even begin certifying feeder airlines until 1945. So Douglas had built a plane for routes nobody flew, at a time when airlines still preferred DC-3s and tri-motors for everything. It's one thing to innovate. 
It's another to sell that innovation into a world that hasn't asked for it yet. Before the DC-5 even rolled out of El Segundo, the orders looked promising. KLM Royal Dutch Airlines signed for four, intending them for short-haul European hops. Pennsylvania Central Airlines, PCA, placed six on the books. Skada of Colombia, precursor to Avianca, asked for two. And British Airways, soon to merge with Imperial Airways to form BOAC, committed to nine units. But the aircraft's fortune was chained to global headlines, and history wasn't kind. Just months after British Airways penned its order, Europe ignited. The British government reallocated funding toward military hardware, cancelling its DC-5 commitment. Skada's German affiliations became a liability, forcing it to restructure and abandon its fleet expansion. PCA changed course, citing uncertain passenger demand for regional flights. One by one, the deals dissolved. Only KLM's order remained intact and even that was rerouted. With war creeping toward the Netherlands, the airline diverted its new DC-5s to colonial operations in the Dutch West Indies and the East Indies. Instead of flying from Amsterdam to Copenhagen, the DC-5 was suddenly lifting off from Batavia, carrying officials and evacuees under looming clouds of invasion. By late 1940, the aircraft had shown potential. By early 1941, that potential had nowhere left to go. Douglas had already converted its El Segundo plant to produce A-20 Havoc bombers and SBD Dauntless dive bombers, cutting the DC-5 line permanently. Just 12 had been completed. One prototype, four for KLM, and seven for the US Navy and Marine Corps. Of those, the prototype was purchased by William Boeing, who used it privately before it was impressed into military service. The four KLM aircraft, diverted to colonial operations, were now under control of KNILM in the Dutch East Indies. As Japanese forces advanced across Southeast Asia, the DC-5s were pressed into duty evacuating civilians from Java to Australia. Three aircraft made it out. The fourth, PKADA, was hit during a Japanese air raid left behind and later repaired by the Imperial Japanese Army Air Force which used it for testing and propaganda flights. Meanwhile, the surviving DC-5s that reached Australia were transferred to the Allied Directorate of Air Transport, re-registered and used by Australian National Airways and No. 21 Squadron RAAF. One was destroyed in an airstrike at Port Moresby. Another made a forced landing and was written off. Only one remained. And so, in a war that devoured even successful aircraft by the thousands, the DC-5 played a quiet, scattered role, its deployments a patchwork of necessity more than strategy. The Douglas DC-5 never got its spotlight moment. Born in the time of transition between regional dreams and global war, it was sidelined before it could truly speak for itself. Technically, it was sound. Ergonomically, it was forward-thinking. But the world wasn't in the mood for short-haul charm when long-range muscle was the language of survival. 